Hello and welcome to our lecture on cancer genetics presented by Remington Venter and John Zimmerman, genetic counselors with the UT Southwestern Cancer Genetics Program. We will review what it means for cancer to be hereditary, discuss some of the more common hereditary cancer syndromes, testing strategies, genetic test results, direct-to-consumer testing, as well as resources available for your practice. All cancers are caused by mutations in genetic information, but most of these are not inherited. Typically, cancers are caused by somatic or acquired mutations that led to abnormal cell growth. On the left is an example of a somatic mutation arising in a cell line within an organism. In this example, most of the cells are wild type or normal, where in specific tissue cells a genetic mutation has occurred. On the right is an example of a germline or inherited mutation, where the sperm used to conceive the person contained a mutated gene. In this example, all of the individual cells and tissues would contain this mutation. Several genes play an important role in the development of cancer. Tumor suppressor genes actively repair DNA lesions that can lead to dysregulation and ultimately cancers or tumors. They act in regulating cell cycle checkpoints, DNA repair, and mutations in these genes generally inactivate them. Oncogenes promote cell division and cell death. However, when mutated, these genes are hyperactivated and it causes rapid cell division. Most hereditary cancer syndromes are due to mutations in tumor suppressor genes, and oncogenes are more likely to be mutated in sporadic cancers or tumors. The two-hit hypothesis of cancer causation proposes mutations in both copies of a gene regulating cancer growth are required to lead to cancer. In non-hereditary cancers, two somatic mutations occur in a tissue throughout the life of an organism that then leads to cancer. In hereditary cancers, the individual is already born with the first hit and only need one somatic mutation in the other copy of the gene to lead to cancer. Despite the topic of this lecture, the majority of cancers are not related to hereditary syndromes. Most are caused by a combination of multiple risk factors, including biological factors, lifestyle choices, and environmental exposures. The number of close relatives diagnosed with cancer, diagnoses under the age of 50, multiple primary tumors in one person, laterality, rarity of cancers, consistency with hereditary syndromes, and multiple generations affected are all factors that can be used to determine if a person is at an increased risk for a hereditary cancer syndrome. There are several hereditary conditions that can cause high lifetime risk for breast cancer or ovarian cancers and may increase risk for other cancers. The diagnoses highlighted here are enough to warrant a referral to genetics. These include a personal diagnosis of breast cancer at or under age 45, a diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer at or under age 60, any breast cancer diagnosed in a male patient, and ovarian cancer diagnosed at any age. This graph shows the lifetime risk of several cancer types in the general population and in those diagnosed with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. However, the original numbers for these risks are higher than those in subsequent studies due to ascertainment bias. Those original studies were performed using HBOC positive patients identified with very strong family histories. We currently quote about a 60% lifetime risk to develop breast cancer for BRCA1 and 50% for BRCA2. A diagnosis of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome comes with several recommendations for cancer risk management. Women are recommended to undergo high-risk breast screening beginning at age 25 and can consider prophylactic mastectomy. They can also consider prophylactic surgery to remove their ovaries and fallopian tubes or can consider screening via ultrasounds and CA-125 serum. However, ovarian cancer screening through these methods have not proven to significantly decrease mortality from ovarian cancer. Men can begin annual clinical breast exams starting at age 25 and baseline PSA at age 40. Recent updates to guidelines recommend that all individuals with HBOC and a family history of pancreatic cancer and a close relative can begin pancreatic cancer screening at age 50 or 10 years younger than the earliest pancreatic cancer in the family. These individuals can also consider annual dermatology and ophthalmology exams. There are several other conditions with high lifetime risk for breast cancer. Mutations in the PTEN gene cause Cowden syndrome, which is also associated with increased risk for uterine and thyroid cancer, and has benign clinical findings. 
There are several other conditions with high lifetime risk for breast cancer. Mutations in the PTEN gene cause Cowden syndrome, which is also associated with increased risk for uterine and thyroid cancer, and has benign clinical findings, such as trichelomomas, which are pathognomonic to Cowden, and macrocephaly. Inherited mutations in the TP53 gene cause Lefram Mini syndrome, which is most notably associated with soft tissue sarcomas. Lefram Mini can cause pediatric cancers and benign tumors with a very high lifetime risk for cancer. Finally, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer is caused by mutations in the CDH1 gene, is more likely to cause lobular over other types of breast cancer, and as screening for diffuse gastric cancer is not very good, it is highly encouraged that these individuals consider a prophylactic gastrectomy. There are several other hereditary conditions that are associated with moderate risk for breast cancer. Studies show that it's more common to carry a mutation in at least one of these genes versus HBOC, and their lifetime risk for breast cancer are still above 20%. However, there is limited evidence supporting prophylactic mastectomy in these individuals. These genes are also associated with other cancer risks. Many of these hereditary breast and or ovarian cancer genes are also associated with risks for pancreatic adenocarcinoma and prostate cancer. This study from the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrated an increased rate of inherited DNA repair gene mutations in men with metastatic prostate cancer, 11.8% in men with metastatic versus 4.6% in those with localized prostate cancers. Mutation frequencies did not differ based on family history of prostate cancer or age of diagnosis. This 2017 article examined the prevalence of germline mutations in patients with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. 302 affected patients underwent genetic testing, and in total, 12% carried at least one mutation. Stratification of this cohort showed that 14% of those with a first-degree relative with pancreatic cancer had germline mutations, and 9% of those without a first-degree relative with pancreatic cancer had germline mutations as well. NCCN guidelines recommend germline genetic testing when somatic tumor testing identifies a mutation that may have clinical implications if also present in the germline. This study in 2016 evaluated genetic variants identified in paired tumor in germline testing on 999 patients. Of those evaluated, 422 individuals were identified with at least one pathogenic somatic variant with the majority in the APC and TP53 genes. The study identified 43 pathogenic germline variants, with 49% being in either BRCA1 or BRCA2. Most of those germline variants in BRCA1 were previously identified by clinical indication, but only half of those in BRCA2 were. Limitations of paired tumor in germline testing include variant filtration is usually limited by those previously identified and classified in databases such as ClinVar. Previously unseen variants may not get classified. Less sensitive at detecting deletions and duplications, variant classification criteria of somatic and germline variants differ, and some variants may not be classified as pathogenic when somatic, but would be if germline. Unable to rely on allele fraction, close to 50%, to determine if germline or somatic. Even if paired, tumor and germline testing does not identify any germline mutations, the patient should still be referred to genetics if personal and or family history meet NCCN criteria. Genetic testing is also clinically indicated if it can aid in making decisions regarding systemic therapy, such as for HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. Polyadenosine diphosphate ribose polymerase, or PARP, is an enzyme that acts like a policeman within the body. It checks for damage, signals where the damage is, then recruits DNA repair mechanisms. Repaired DNA leads to cell survival. In normal cells, BRCA genes aid in DNA damage repair, and PARP aids in DNA damage repair. However, in people who have a mutated BRCA gene, their BRCA repair isn't working. PARP is still working and can fix the damaged DNA, keeping the cell alive. When we give a patient a PARP inhibitor, the idea is that the drug will interfere with DNA repair. However, if someone doesn't have a BRCA mutation, the BRCA repair mechanism is still working. In this case, both repair mechanisms are inhibited, leading to cell death of the cancerous cells. The following examples are criteria to consider use of a PARP inhibitor in therapy. These criteria are specific for aloparib. They can be indicated if pathogenic mutations are found as either germline or somatic 
for ovarian or prostate cancers. The ATM gene works in the BRCA1 pathway. Aloparib is not yet FDA approved in the treatment of patients with prostate cancer. Aloparib was associated with improved radiographic progression-free survival in a phase three trial of patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer and homologous recombination deficiency mutations, according to the profound study. But at the moment, it remains investigational for prostate cancer. Let's shift gears to discuss hereditary colorectal cancer. An estimated 5% of colorectal cancer is hereditary. As you would expect, this percentage is increased in individuals with early onset colon cancer. A seminal study from Ohio State published in JAMA Oncology in 2017 analyzed the prevalence of germline cancer susceptibility mutations in individuals with early onset colorectal cancer. 450 patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer under age 50 were tested via a 25 gene hereditary cancer panel. One out of six or 16% were found to have a mutation in one of these genes. 8.7% of these patients were found to have a mutation in the Lynch syndrome associated gene, which we will discuss in the next few slides, while 8% were found to have a mutation in another non-Lynch syndrome gene, as illustrated in the pie graph. These are the NCCN guidelines for evaluation of Lynch syndrome. Lynch evaluation can include both germline genetic testing as well as tumor screening, which we will discuss later. A diagnosis of colon or endometrial cancer under the age of 50 warrants a referral for a genetic evaluation, regardless of family history or tumor screening results. A family history of multiple relatives with colon or uterine cancer on the same side of the family or relatives with early onset colon or uterine cancer should also prompt a genetics referral. It's also important to recognize some of the cancers associated with Lynch syndrome when considering the necessity of genetics evaluation. We will review the Lynch syndrome cancer spectrum in greater detail on a future slide. Lynch syndrome, also known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, is the most common hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome with a prevalence of 1 in 300. It is also the most common cause of hereditary colon cancer, accounting for 1 to 3 percent of all colon cancers and up to 1.4 percent of endometrial cancers. It is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and caused by mutations in the mismatch repair genes. Of note, the EPCAM gene is not a mismatch repair gene. EPCAM is located upstream of the MSH2 gene. Specific mutations in EPCAM cause silencing of the MSH2 gene via methylation, resulting in a phenotype similar to MSH2-associated Lynch syndrome. MLH1 and MSH2 mutations are the most commonly mutated genes in Lynch syndrome, accounting for approximately 70% of the mutations identified. This is a pedigree of a family with Lynch syndrome. The proband was diagnosed with rectal cancer at age 51 with the tumor demonstrating absent MSH2 and MSH6 proteins via mismatch repair IHC, suggestive of a germline MSH2 gene mutation. The family history is also consistent with Lynch syndrome, with several individuals diagnosed with early onset colon cancer and other cancers in the Lynch syndrome spectrum, including endometrial, ovarian, and bladder cancers. Although the patient's tumor results were suggestive of an MSH2 mutation, a multi-gene germline panel test was ordered given the family history of multiple cancers. Testing identified a germline MSH2 mutation. A maternal female cousin with a history of endometrial and colon cancers was also found to have the familial mutation. The next two slides illustrate the Lynch syndrome cancer spectrum and lifetime cancer risks. Cancer risks vary by gene, with MLH1 and MSH2 mutations generally associated with the highest overall risks for cancer, and PMS2 mutations associated with the lowest cancer risks. Colorectal and endometrial cancers are the canonical Lynch syndrome cancers. The lifetime risk for colon cancer ranges from 46 to 61% for MLH1 mutation carriers, with an estimated average age of presentation at 44 years, to between 8.7 to 20% for PMS2 mutation carriers with an estimated average age of presentation of 61 to 66 years. The risks for endometrial cancer range from 21 to 57% and MSH2 and EPCAM mutation carriers with an average age of presentation between 47 to 48 years to 13 to 26% in PMS2 mutation carriers with an average age of onset between 49 to 50 years. We also see increased risk for other GI and GU cancers as well as brain tumors. The following two slides summarize the NCCN guidelines for Lynch syndrome surveillance and management. Recommendations vary by gene. Early and more frequent colonoscopy surveillance is recommended beginning at age 20 to 25 for individuals with mutations in MLH1, 
MSH2 and EPCAM, and age 30 to 35 for individuals with MSH6 and PMS2 mutations, and repeating every one to two years. Age to initiate colonoscopy may be modified if there is a family history of colorectal cancer earlier than the recommended age to begin surveillance. There are data demonstrating that daily aspirin use decreases colorectal cancer risk in Lynch syndrome. However, this has not been shown for all Lynch syndrome genes, and studies are ongoing to determine the optimal dose and duration. Gastric and small bowel cancer surveillance via EGD can be considered, especially for those with MLH1 and MSH2 mutations and other gastric cancer risk factors beginning at age 40 and every three to five years thereafter. Annual urinalysis may be considered, especially those with a family history of urothelial cancer. Pancreatic cancer surveillance via MRI slash MRICP and or EUS may be considered for individuals with Lynch syndrome and a first or second degree relative with exocrine pancreatic cancer on the same side or presumed to be on the same side of the family as the identified mutation. Of note, with the exception of MLH1, there are limited data on pancreatic cancer risks among carriers of mutations in the other Lynch syndrome genes and no apparent increased risk for pancreatic tumors in PMS2 mutation carriers. Hysterectomy is a risk-reducing option that can be considered for women with Lynch syndrome. Risk-reducing bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy may also be considered. However, NCCN guidelines note that there are insufficient data to make recommendations for BSO for MSH6 and PMS2 mutation carriers, and that PMS2 mutations do not appear to have a greater than average risk for ovarian cancer. Screening for endometrial and ovarian cancer via endometrial biopsy, transvaginal ultrasound, and CA125 do not have a proven benefit, but may be considered at a clinician's discretion, such as in women with a family history of these cancers. There are currently no NCCN guidelines for modified prostate cancer or breast cancer screening in individuals with Lynch syndrome. While Lynch syndrome does appear to be associated with increased prostate cancer risks, the data regarding the association between Lynch syndrome and breast cancer is limited and conflicting, with newer studies showing no increased risk. Several professional societies and organizations, including NCCN, the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, and the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, recommend universal Lynch syndrome screening of all colorectal cancers and endometrial cancer. Screening can be performed via mismatch repair IHC or MSI analysis. Over 90% of the Lynch syndrome tumors will screen abnormal through one of these methods. Mismatch repair or MMR IHC detects the presence or absence of the four MMR proteins in the tumor. These proteins exist in dimers. MLH1 is dimerized with PMS2, and MSH2 is dimerized with MSH6. The absence of one or more of these proteins via IHC can indicate an inherited pathogenic mutation and which gene may be involved. MLH1 and MSH2 remain stable when not dimerized. However, this is not the case for PMS2 and MSH6. As such, loss of MLH1 and MSH2 expression result in a loss of the entire dimer, whereas a loss of MSH6 and PMS2 result in the absence of those proteins only. Notably, loss of MLH1 and PMS2 may be due to somatic methylation of the MLH1 protein, resulting in absent expression of the dimer, and MLH1 methylation analysis is indicated for this IHC result. Germline testing with or without paired tumor sequencing can help clarify the etiology of abnormal MMR IHC. MSI analysis is another Lynch syndrome tumor screening tool. This PCR-based technology analyzes stretches of repetitive DNA sequences, known as microsatellites, which are susceptible to replication errors if mismatch repair function is impaired. Five markers are typically analyzed for MSI with instability, with the result of MSI-H or MSI-high denoting over 30% instability and potential Lynch syndrome. In addition to serving as useful screening tools for Lynch syndrome evaluation, mismatch repair IHC and MSI analysis could also have significant treatment implications. In 2017, the FDA approved pembrolizumab, trade name Keytruda, for the treatment of all unresectable or metastatic solid tumors demonstrating MSI high or deficient mismatch repair that progress with treatment using certain first-line chemotherapy drugs. In June 2020, Keytruda was FDA approved as a first-line treatment for these tumors. Pembrolizumab is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Some tumors have ligands known as PDL1, which bind to PD1 receptors found on T cells and inhibit their anti tumor activity. PDL1 receptors are highly expressed in certain tumors, including those exhibiting deficient mismatch repair or MSI high. 
Pembrolizumab binds to the PD-1 receptor and blocks its interaction with PD-L1, thereby allowing T cells to attack the tumor. There are other hereditary cancer syndromes associated with increased risks for colorectal cancer in the context of polyposis. Familial adenomatous polyposis is an autosomal dominant condition associated with mutations in the APC gene. The presentation can range from fewer than 100 adenomatous polyps in the attenuated form to hundreds or even thousands of polyps in classic FAP. The risk for colorectal cancer is virtually 100% without intervention. MUTYH-associated polyposis, or MAP, is an autosomal recessive condition caused by mutations in the MUTYH gene. MAP typically presents with a milder phenotype compared to FAP, averaging tens to hundreds of polyps. MAP carriers, that is those with monoallelic MUTYH mutations, may have a slightly elevated risk for colon cancer as well. These conditions are also associated with extracolonic manifestations such as upper GI cancers and tumors and thyroid cancer in the case of FAP. A genetics evaluation is indicated for all individuals with a personal history of over 10 cumulative adenomas or any of the extracolonic manifestations listed here. Earlier and more frequent colonoscopy surveillance is recommended for the individuals with hereditary adenomatous polyposis with an earlier initiation for FAP versus MAP. For individuals whose polyp burden cannot be managed via colonoscopy, proctocolectomy or colectomy is recommended. Additional surveillance includes upper endoscopy and thyroid ultrasound for FAP patients. The hamartomatous polyposis syndromes, including Putz-Jaeger's juvenile polyposis and P10 hamartoma tumor syndromes, the latter representing a spectrum including Cowden syndrome. The polyps seen in these syndromes are uncommon, and the presence of any of these polyp types, including PJS type polyps, juvenile polyps, and GI hamartoma or ganglionaromas, warrants a genetics referral. These syndromes can be multi-system and highly variable in presentation, characterized by increased risk for malignancy and other non-cancerous features. Now that you have a sense of the indications for hereditary cancer evaluation and some of the more commonly encountered hereditary cancer predisposition syndromes, let's review strategies and considerations for hereditary cancer testing. As you can see, the hereditary cancer testing landscape has changed significantly in the last 10 or so years and continues to evolve. In the early days of cancer genetics, testing was limited to a handful of genes known at the time. It was expensive, typically not covered by insurance, and often took several weeks to complete. With the advent of next-generation sequencing and multi-gene panel testing, cancer genetic test offerings have expanded dramatically. On the right is an example of an 80-plus gene panel which can be ordered and resulted in two weeks for a self-pay cost of $250, or even less for those with insurance coverage available, which is now commonplace. There are several factors to consider when deciding on the best panel option for a patient. Technical specifications include sequencing coverage, copy number variant analysis, also known as deletion duplication analysis, and the variant classification and review process. The personal and family cancer history can help guide panel selection. For patients with a family history of multiple varied cancers or those who meet NCCN testing guidelines for more than one condition, a large pan cancer panel may be indicated whereas patients with a personal or family history of only one type of cancer could consider a more targeted disease-specific panel. Some panels include genes with limited preliminary evidence regarding disease association, which the patient or ordering clinician may or may not wish to include. Other factors to consider are insurance coverage, including laboratory benefits investigation process and self-pay options, and test turnaround time. The three possible genetic results include negative, positive, and uncertain, which encompass variants classified across the spectrum you see here. A negative result indicates that either there were no variants identified or that the variants that were identified are of no clinical significance. Cancer screening and management for patients with a negative result are based on personal and family history. A variant of uncertain significance or VUS result means that there was a variant identified in one or more genes but there is insufficient clinical or research data to establish variant pathogenicity. Up to 30% of individuals undergoing multi-gene panel testing have one or more VUS identified, with these findings being more common in non-Caucasian populations. Importantly, management for individuals with a VUS should be based on personal and family history and not the VUS. 
A positive result indicates that a likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant was identified. Management is based on the cancer risks associated with the gene and variant. In our program experience, approximately 15% of patients who undergo testing will have a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant, with 4% of these patients having more than one clinically actionable variant. The classification of a variant may vary by laboratory. There are numerous labs offering hereditary cancer genetic testing. There are also a variety of reasons why a provider may choose to order from one lab versus another, such as test offerings, insurance, financial assistance programs, and the quality of testing. While there are ACMG guidelines for variant interpretation based on literature and functional studies, each laboratory has their own unique variant classification algorithm. Some of these algorithms rely on internal data not publicly available to other laboratories for use in their variant classification. As a result, the same variant may be classified as clinically significant by one laboratory and not clinically significant by another laboratory. This presents challenges for clinicians in making appropriate management recommendations for patients based on these results. A variant with discrepant classification requires a careful review of available data on the variant and case-by-case -case decision making for management recommendations. Variant interpretations can be reclassified based on new evidence. The UT Southwestern Cancer Genetics Program, in collaboration with Myriad Genetic Laboratories, published a study in JAMA in 2018, which examined the prevalence of variant reclassification in hereditary cancer genetic testing. The study included over 1.45 million individuals and found that 6.4% of nearly 45,000 unique variants identified in the study were ultimately reclassified. While most of these reclassifications were within the same category, that is likely benign to benign or likely pathogenic to pathogenic, close to 8% of VUSs were reclassified during the study period, with 9% of these being upgraded to a positive result. A small percentage of results were upgraded from negative to positive or downgraded from positive to negative, all of which have implications for the patient's management. Genetic testing is more than just a simple blood test. There are psychosocial, ethical, and insurance implications for patients to consider when deciding if testing is right for them. Patients may experience anxiety or depression when learning that they are at an increased risk for cancer. There could also be feelings of guilt related to passing on an inherited cancer risk to offspring or surviving a cancer diagnosis or remaining cancer-free in the setting of a family history of hereditary cancer in which others have died of their disease. Genetic testing can also have implications for insurance coverage. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, abbreviated GINA, prohibits most health insurance companies and employers from using genetic information against individuals. However, the protections of, the, of this law do not extend to life insurance, long-term care insurance, or disability insurance. Lastly, there are ethical implications, including questions about duty to warn when patients refuse to share positive genetic test results with family members. Direct-to-consumer means tests marketed to, sold to, and ordered by consumers without any healthcare provider involvement. Questions regarding direct-to-consumer testing have grown in popularity with the products. According to the MIT Technology Review, by the start of 2019, over 26 million individuals have undergone testing with the four largest direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies. With testing becoming more common, it is more common for patients to present to clinics asking their healthcare providers to interpret the relevance of these results. There are many different companies offering genetic testing that you can order online, have kits mailed to your home, and tell you about your ancestry, your dog's health, the best diet for you, or what wine you like best. The variants identified in these tests can include polymorphisms, risk factors, and clinically significant mutations. In early 2018, the FDA approved 23andMe to test for specific mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, raising questions and concerns for healthcare providers. However, this testing screens only for the three Ashkenazi Jewish mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 and is not comprehensive for the thousands of other pathogenic variants in these genes. It also does not screen for pathogenic variants in other breast cancer genes. 
In this study, a clinical testing laboratory with extensive history of hereditary cancer genetic testing evaluated 49 samples from patients referred to confirm variants identified using direct-to-consumer raw data. In these patients, 40% of those positive mutations were seen in the direct-to-consumer raw data were not confirmed in clinical grade or diagnostic genetic testing. NCCN recommends confirmatory germline testing through an appropriately certified laboratory when a potential pathogenic variant is identified through direct-to-consumer tumor or research testing. In 2019, 23andMe was back in the headlines for receiving FDA clearance to add two variants in the MUTYH gene to their testing and reports. The two variants that they evaluate are the most common mutations in this gene to in which 1-2% to of individuals with Northern European ancestry will carry. However, there are other clinically significant variants in these genes, and they are much less common in people of other ancestry. This testing could miss these other variants or create a false sense of security regarding hereditary cancer risks. Why is it important to identify patients with a hereditary cancer predisposition? Let's look at the big picture. One in 500 Americans has a BRCA mutation, and one in 300 has Lynch syndrome. However, 90% of individuals with BRCA mutations and 95% of patients with Lynch syndrome are undiagnosed. This equates to over 70,000 people in Texas who do not know that they have a hereditary cancer predisposition and are at increased risk for preventable cancers. So what can family medicine physicians and other primary care clinicians do to help? Family history is arguably the most essential tool in identifying patients with hereditary cancer predispositions. Clinicians should collect, review, and update a patient's personal and family history annually, being mindful of hereditary cancer red flags. Several validated screening tools have been developed to aid the identification of high-risk patients. The table on the right is from a 2020 editorial in American Family Physician, summarizing useful family history tools for breast and ovarian cancer risk assessment. PREM5 is a clinical prediction algorithm developed by Dana-Farber used to estimate a patient's probability to have Lynch syndrome germline mutations. These tools are brief, easy to use, and can be readily incorporated into practice. So you've identified a patient who is at high risk for a hereditary cancer predisposition. Now what? A cancer genetics risk assessment is indicated for all patients identified to be at high risk. The UT Southwestern Cancer Genetics Program comprises 15 genetic counselors who are available to see patients in person or via telehealth at multiple clinics throughout the DFW Metroplex. For patients outside the DFW area, the National Society of Genetic Counselors website has a Find a Genetic Counselor directory, which allows anyone to search a genetic counselor nationwide by specialty and location. Additionally, the Texas Society of Genetic Counselors website, a state chapter of the national organization, has Texas-specific genetic resources for you and your patients. Some additional resources for you and your practice include the NCCN Clinical Practice Guidelines in Oncology, as well as Joint Practice Guidelines from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the National Society of Genetic Counselors on referral indications for cancer genetics risk assessment. We hope this presentation has provided you with a foundational understanding of hereditary cancer syndromes and tools to identify the high-risk patients in your practice please feel free to contact us via email or phone with any questions.